Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. O Holy Trinity, have mercy on us. O Lord, cleanse us from our sins. Master, pardon our iniquities. Holy God, visit and heal our infirmities for thy name's sake. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Illumine our hearts, O Lord Jesus Christ, our God, with the pure light of thy divine knowledge, and plant in us also the fear of thy blessed commandments. Trampling down all carnal desires, may enter spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things that are well pleasing unto thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies of Christ our God, and unto thee we ascribe glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Okay. So today, we're going to take a look at a number of icons, and I do want you to stop me along the way if you happen to have any questions. We're going to look at the icons of, well, what I call the icons of the Holy Week. Okay, so let me see if I can pull the first one I wanted to show you. Yes, okay. That, and I'll do this. Okay, so the icon that we're looking at here, we call the icon of the bridegroom, all right? And um, doesn't look like a bridegroom, does he? He's doing, there are a number of things here that are um, worth pointing out. Now this particular icon is brought out into the church on Sunday night. So we've had um, the Feast of Palm Sunday for the Divine Liturgy. And then we have the first of what we call the Bridegroom Matins. Okay, and we can see he's, you know, we've got the, the title Bridegroom. He's wearing his crown of thorns, his reed in his hands, he's wearing the scarlet robe. He looks um, pretty much like he would look during his trial, right? So that's actually part of the whole message here is that this is the beginning of his passion. He's entered into Jerusalem triumphantly, fulfilling the messianic expectation, but he's about to change things considerably. So the bridegroom matins themselves are comprised of three or in some traditions, four services that are held the evening of that particular night. So Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, sometimes other traditions have it on Wednesday also, ours does not. The bridegroom here is obviously Christ, but we have the remembrance of the bridegroom from the um, parable of the wise and foolish virgins from Matthew 25. The wise and foolish virgins, you have five virgins that are wise, five virgins that are foolish, and they are all expected to be ready to wait for the bridegroom. He is delayed. And because he's delayed, the foolish ones don't have enough oil for their lamps. They have to run off and buy the oil. By the time they come back, it's too late. Okay, and that's the essence of the message that we have in the bridegroom service itself, all of these bridegroom services. Okay, um, I keep telling people they need to be ready. Well, that's part of the message that is found here he is dressed up as the one who is beaten and so there is an intentional paradox here but the paradox is on multiple levels okay the first paradox is he is not dressed like a bridegroom he's dressed like a man who's been beaten a man who's being humiliated a man who's being mocked derided scorned He's not dressed like a bridegroom. If we went to a wedding where we saw a bridegroom dressed like this, we'd wonder what was going on, right? 
but there he is dressed as the bridegroom. So we have that particular paradox, but we have a second paradox, okay? And that second paradox is that our God, you know, because remember, he's the fashioner of the universe. Our God is actually being beaten and mocked and ridiculed, okay? Which is really kind of horrible if you think about it, okay? So that's the second paradox that's here, all right? There's another meaning to this also, that he is indeed the bridegroom of the church. The church is the bride. But what we have in that message is that this is the steps, these are the steps that he must undertake in order to become our true bridegroom. He has to endure death by death. He has to go through this humiliation in order for us to um, be saved. Okay, so all of these things are wrapped up into this icon, all right? Does it make sense? And if you do have any questions, let, just let me know. Across the top, we have that familiar phrase, the one, right? Which is taken from Exodus 3. It's Moses's, um, it's the reply that God gives to Moses when Moses says, um, who are you? I am the existing one. I am the one who is, okay? And we also have the IC again, the first and last letters of Jesus, XC, the first and last letters of Christ in Greek. And so there's um, pretty much the major points of the icon. I'm going to read a couple of things to you. There are the Psalms. Okay, so here's the Troparian of the night that we have the, these services. Behold, the bridegroom cometh at midnight, and blessed is the servant whom he shall find awake. But he whom he shall find neglectful is verily unworthy. Behold, therefore, my soul beware, lest thou fallest into deep slumber, and the door of the kingdom be closed against thee, and thou be delivered unto death. But be thou wakeful, crying, holy, holy, holy art thou, our God, through the intercessions of, well, we have here are the incorporeals, which are angels, through the intercessions of the angels, have mercy on us. Amen. The second then is St. Elias, because we repeat this triparian three times. The second is St. Elias. The third is the mother of God. As we go throughout the week, um, we change that first one, because Monday in our church, is the remembrance of the angelic powers. So each day has a particular saint that we remember. Okay, if you look at, um, let's see if I can get to it real quick. On uh, Tuesday, we remember the forerunner, St. John the Baptist. Um, Wednesday, remember the precious and life-giving cross. Thursday, remember St. Nicholas. And Friday, we remember Again, the cross, the crucifixion of our Lord. Okay, so on Monday night, which is, you know, for us, it's Sunday night, really the eve of the day. Because remember for us, um, when we think of the beginning of the day, at least liturgically speaking, the beginning of the day is the evening of the day before. Okay. So we see his blood um, from the crown of thorns. We see the reed again that he's beaten. He's beaten over the head with the reed, which embeds the crowns, you know, the thorns in his head even more. So it's kind of horrible. Okay, so we have that particular icon that we use during the bridegroom services, the first three. The next service, the major service that we have is um, the service of holy unction. Now the service of holy unction doesn't really have an icon that's specific to Holy Week. Um, there are all sorts of icons that you can use. You could use Christ the Healer. Excuse me. Use Christ the Healer, but you could also use the mercenary saints like Cosmos and Damien, like Pentamela, uh, Pentalemon, people like that. Okay, so um, those are um, things that we can you know, employ, but generally we just don't. We leave things the way they are. Okay. 
All right. Questions about that icon? Okay. When does Lent start this year? I just looked that up. It's around the 7th of March. Okay. I'm pretty sure it's the 7th of March. I can look it up real quick again. Yes, it is. 7th of March. Okay. So, so the night, um, the night of Wednesday, we have the service of Holy Unction in our church. Now, the reason for that service in our church is because of the, what happens the next morning. And what happens the next morning is the Eucharist, the, the remembrance of our Lord's Last Supper. Okay, so in the Last Supper, we have two things that happen. Um, but before we get to that, I want to talk a little bit more about unction, and that is the purpose of unction for in Holy Week is not necessarily, it's not meant to be a healing service, although it certainly is that. Um, it's meant to be something else. You see, in the old days, it used to be that people really couldn't go to confession for whatever reason. And so confession sort of fell out of fashion. But if you're going to go and you're going to receive the holiest of the Eucharists, which would be the, the morning of when things are instituted, right? You know, we're remembering the very last supper. So in order to go and to receive worthily, something has to be done. It can either be confession or it can be unction. So in this case, the unction service isn't meant necessarily to be a healing service. It's meant more to be a service that prepares the people who are going to receive communion the next day. Okay, um, this was a very common practice, and that's why you will see in some traditions that the Wednesday night service, as I said earlier, is the fourth bridegroom service. It is an unction because they never had a time when a priesthood couldn't hear someone's confessions. All right, so because we had the practice where the priest wasn't hearing confessions, unction would serve the purpose of the forgiving that one receives in confession. So that makes the people worthy to receive the Eucharist the next day, okay? There are two things that happen, though, on that Thursday morning, and so we have two icons also. Let's see if I can bring this up. I don't know where the foot washing went. No, it's not there. It's hard to see it on my computer, so just give me one second here. I'll look for it. Not that one, but that one. Okay, there we are. All right, the foot washing. So that's a, one of the major things that we do on Thursday morning. I mean, I haven't done it liturgically ever, but that is a practice that the... Um, priest comes and washes the feet of select people on the morning of the Lord's Last Supper. And let me see if I can find that real quick in here. So if you would look at the service of Holy Thursday, you see that there are all sorts of um, readings from the Old Testament. There are three readings from the whole Old Testament. The epistle reading is the institution of the Lord's Supper from Corinthians. Okay. Okay, and then if you listen to the gospel of Holy Thursday morning, you hear the, it's a, it's a composite gospel Generally, we say it's from the Gospel of St. Matthew, but there's Matthew here, there's John here, Matthew and Luke, and so on. It's, it's a very long Gospel. But in the Gospel of St. John, we have this. This is John 13, verses 3 through 17. 
And knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, Jesus rose from supper, laid aside his, laid aside his garments, and girded himself with a towel. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. He came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not know now, but afterwards you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If, you, if I do not wash you, you have no part in me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but he is clean all over. And you are clean, but not every one of you, for he knew who was about to betray him. And that's why he said you were not all clean. And then he finished washing their feet, put his garments back on, and resumed his place. Okay, so um, let's talk about that just a little bit, because I like for us to have a understanding of what's going on here. So foot washing. Um, I don't know how if you're familiar with the sanitary conditions of things back in the time of Jesus, but you can pretty much guess that they weren't given the same kinds of luxuries that we are like, you know, sewage systems and things like that. And in fact, um, it was exactly the opposite, that the sewers were sort of, sort of like open gutters that ran through the cities. And so, and I mean, there are also horses that are wandering around and there's all sorts of other not so pleasant stuff. And so when you're walking, you're going to get messy and like filthy messy. It's gonna smell, it's gonna look horrible. Um, so him washing the feet of the disciples is really an act of humility and to some degree an act of humiliation. Okay, so that is, um, one of the greater marks of what it is that our Lord is all about, that he is so, he is willing to wash the feet of of his disciples. It's a sign of just how much he truly loves them. OK, and also the awesome humility of our God. Right. So it's not just a matter of, you know, I've been in a tennis shoe all day and my feet are sweaty. No, it's way worse than that, <laughs> actually. And so to have him wash the feet is really kind of very humbling, all right? Okay, any questions about that? Okay, I'll be right, give me one second, I want to, I'll be right back. Well. Okay, but since we were remembering in that service, not just the um, let me get my video back here for a second. Since we were remembering not just the foot washing, but also the Last Supper, that's the next thing that we are going to take a look at here. Okay, so let's look at that one. Give me one second. Father, I have a question. Of course, anything, please. There's only 11. There's 11. Yes, I noticed that. Previous. Yes, that means Judas is missing. Yeah. He's already gone. But you know, in that case, he really wasn't gone yet. Um, well, no, maybe he is gone by then. Let me look. Hold on one second. He might be gone by then. No. He has not gone, just, well, let's see. Yeah, at least according to this, no, he has not gone yet. But that, I mean, that is the one who is missing. It's clearly Judas, okay? So let's go back to that. Oops, do that. Notice none of them have halos, so that doesn't really help us a whole lot. 
But we can see that the twins are there. Uh, Thomas called the twin is there. John is there, the disciple Jesus loves. This is Peter having the conversation with Jesus. Um, Thomas and, and John both are lacking facial hair, by the way. So at this, this icon seems to give the indication that, um, that Judas is gone at this point. He's not there. So back to the mystical supper, all right? Now this is a slightly different indication. And look at this. So the disciples are talking amongst themselves. We have John resting his head on the bosom of Jesus. We have the one reaching out to touch, to dip his fingers in the bowl. That's Judas right there. Thomas is on the bottom, called the twin. Um, and there are a number of other youngsters along with the older ones. Um, remember also what we had said before, that when you take a look at an icon and you see a, a, a linen across the tops of the buildings, that's meant to indicate that they are inside, right? So that is um, indeed what they are. They're inside this building, okay? In the upper room, having their last supper, okay? so. Um, what else? We'll just go ahead and, um, let's see. Let's go ahead and read this gospel a little bit more. When he had washed their feet and taken his garments, he resumed his place and said to them, do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord and you are right for so I am. If I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet for I've given you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Truly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. As they were sitting, Jesus said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to one another, is that I Lord? And he answered, he who dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. And so we see the dish in front of Jesus and he's going to dip his hand in the dish. Okay, hold on one second. Good evening. Hello. Ah, Debbie. Yep. I just remembered. Oh, well, I'm glad you're here. So we're talking about, you can see the Last Supper right now, I'm assuming, right? Right. Good, okay. So we're talking about that, and I just read a little bit from uh, the Gospel of Holy Thursday morning. I'm going to take you back just one second. We've dealt with the icon of the bridegroom, and you can go back um, in your leisure and take a look at that. But since we're dealing with two things on the morning of Thursday, I want to talk about both of them. So the first one... You see right there. The second one is the washing of Jesus's feet, and I'll show you that here. Oops, did it again. A second. Okay, so you see the icon of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Um, there are eleven of them in the icon, which seems to indicate that Judas has already gone his way. Whether or not he has is a matter of speculation but that's how the iconographer chose to interpret it. Um, as I pointed out before, you see the linen that is hanging from the two buildings at the top. That means that they're indoors, okay? It's an interesting effect because that's really the only thing that signifies being indoors from being outdoors. Okay, so there's Jesus washing the feet and you have Peter very concerned that Jesus is washing his feet and even there, there is a, you know, some, um, Peter has some consternation about that. 
but our Lord says that um, it has to happen this way. And then he talks about how he, as the master of them, is willing to wash their feet. And so that means that they, as equals, should wash each other's feet. Okay, so, so that's the foot washing. And then we go straight in into the mystical supper. Okay, and there we have John resting his head on the bosom of Jesus. John is the disciple that Jesus loves. We have Judas dipping his hand into the bowl that is sitting in front of Jesus. You have the disciples talking to one another. You have Thomas, the twin over here. Um, again, it's indoors. Okay, and so I'm just going to read this a little bit. Let's see. Okay. So I had just said, as they were eating, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful. And they began to say to one another, is it I? And he answered, he who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The son of man goes as it is written to him, but woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been better if that man had never been born. Judas, who did betray him, said, is it I, master? He said to him, you have said so. Okay, so that's where we are so far. Got it. Okay. Continuing on then. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I shall not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it anew with you in my father's kingdom okay all right and then to continue on with the reading and when they had sung a hymn they went out to the mount of olives and jesus said to them you will all fall away because of me this night for it is written i will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered but after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter declared to him, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, this very night before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Okay, so that's the gospel reading. Um, and that's not it in its entirety, but you get the gist of it all. Okay, so it, it transitions. The first thing that happens in the gospel is the disciples go and tell the person that they are um, of need of the room. The master is needing the room. And so they go and they prepare everything for the supper. Then Jesus washes their feet. Judas departs. And then um, they have the last supper. And then they go to the Mount of Olives. Okay, so all of that is in the gospel for Holy Thursday. A couple other aspects of the Holy Thursday gospel. It is a Vesperal liturgy of St. Basil. Okay, so, um, so it's a little bit longer, but it also has all the element. The, the first half of the service is more like Vespers with, Oh Lord, I have cried the hymn and all of that. Um, and then after that, um, at, the, at the entrance, then we transition from Vespers into St. Basil's Divine Liturgy, okay? Any other questions about that? So what comes after that in terms of the services of the church? The reading of the 12 Gospels. Oh. So we go immediately from that morning liturgy where we have the Last Supper to Jesus um, going through his trial. And so we can bring back the bridegroom. Because that's the first thing that happens. He goes to the Mount of Olives, he goes and he prays, and he's arrested. Judas kisses him, so that's his betrayal. And then he's led off to be accused by Ananias and Caiaphas, Annas and Caiaphas, 
the two, the, the high priest and the father-in-law of the high priest. And, um, and he's beaten and mocked and all those kinds of things. And then ultimately he is crucified, right? Yes. Let's see if I can find that here. Oh, yes. Now these icons are not our icons but um, there are a couple of interesting things to see here. So I thought it would be good for us to look at them. Okay. Um, this is an icon of our Lord plus the two thieves and some others, right? So let's see, what all do we have here? We have two guards. We have the mother of God and the other myrrh bearers. We have John. We have a man who ran to get a, a sponge loaded with vinegar for him to drink. We have the good thief and we have the bad thief. Okay. Most icons will only have the mother of God and John. Here. Okay, but in this case, we have more than that. Okay. And um, the couple of other things to point out, and at least in this icon, and we're going to deal with another one here in a second. But remember, there is a centurion that when he watches the manner in which Jesus dies, he says, surely this is the son of God. And that's this one here. And then the two thieves are in different poses and i believe you have the one here one of them it's hard to tell in this icon you'll see very much more clear in the other icon which one's the good thief and which one's the bad thief at this point you can see that they're both in pain um but there's you know not an easy way to tell who's what and then you have down here you have the skull and you have the blood going down into the abyss, which is you know another symbolic thing about the blood of Jesus going in and um, you know bringing life to those who are in Hades. Okay, but I want you to look at this icon because it's pretty interesting. Have you ever seen this icon before? Ooh. No. It's pretty intense, isn't it? A lot going on in this icon. Those angels? Oh, there's some angels in there. There's some demons in there. There's Mary fainting. Um, you have the rod with the hyssop you have the spear you can see the spear on the left hand side sort of sticking up towards one or the other um, you have the men breaking the legs of the two that were crucified with our lord um, you have angels in all sorts of manner of lamentation and weeping so okay i'm gonna go out on a limb and say let's go back to the other one Okay, this, um, the, the thief to our right, to Jesus's left, is in all likelihood the bad thief, and the one on He's the backwards. left. What's that? One of them, one to his left is backwards. Now he's, he's backwards, he wasn't before. Right, yeah, I'm gonna show you, that's why I'm thinking that the one it's on, you know, if, if you're looking from Jesus's perspective, not from ours, it's the one yeah. on Jesus's left, that's the bad thief. And the one on the right, on Jesus's right, is the good thief. Okay. What I wanted to point out was the spear in this particular centurion, and you can see the wound from our Lord here, right, in his side. So that's the soldier who pierced the side of Jesus and outflowed blood and water, okay? 
That is a, a reference. I mean, we have that in our Eucharistic service. One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately there pour forth blood and water. He who has seen it is born witness and his witness is true. That comes directly from the gospel of St. John. Let's go back to the other icon and you'll see why I think this. So you look at this icon here and you see the, the hair, but more importantly, see this little creature right here? That's the soul of the bad thief. And the soul is being plucked by this demon. Wait, where are you? I can't see where you are. Okay, so um, you're looking at the icon of the crucifixion. And yeah. we're looking on the right side. From our perspective, you're looking at the right side of okay. the icon. Let me see if I can use my pencil here. Give me a second. Let's see. There we go. Draw. Draw here. I'm talking about this right here. Can you see what I just circled? Oh, yeah, your face was there. Okay. Yeah, I see right oh. there. All right. Yeah. It's hard to tell how these All right. work. Now, All what right. is that again? That's the soul of the bad thief. Oh, right above his head. Yep. Okay. Because gotcha. the demon's taking the soul. Okay. All right. Oh, now, I see that. Yeah. Okay. Now let me show you on the other side. Right here. You see the soul of the good thief. Oh, right? that's okay. And the answer. Okay. Yep. And what does Jesus say to the good thief? But today you will be in paradise with me. Right. So that's okay. where we get that from okay so on the left we have in our left we have the good thief on the our right we have the bad thief you have um here this one is breaking the legs of the one thief this one is breaking the legs of the other thief we have the big sword right here or i'm sorry the spear right here that was piercing jesus's side you have an angel right here catching the blood coming out of Jesus in a chalice. See that? Oh, right that yeah. Okay. Right. So you have the dead. Look at the bottom left-hand corner. Yes. You're all the dead coming out of the grave at the death of Jesus. Okay. You have the soldiers casting lots for his garments. You have someone trying to give him something to drink. You have this also, this is the hyssop here with a sponge on it. So you've got a lot of things going on in this icon. Kind of hard for me to see to tell you the truth. Oh, mm. I missed something. This is kind of gross. Look who's there. Who's that? That's Judas hanging from a tree. Oh, okay. I can't couldn't see what that was. He's hanging. Okay. Yep. Let's see All if right. I can blow it up a little. Hold I on. got it. Oops, that's not gonna help. Shoot. Nope. Yeah, when I do that. Oh, come on. There we go. See? I lost it. Let me try and blow it up a little more. I lost the picture altogether. Oh, did you? Yeah. Hmm. I got Nancy's and Mary's names. Oh, wait. Anyone else see it? Okay. All right. What's that circle on the black thing on the post on the I'm cross? getting rid of those. Yeah, right. Oh, That's okay. from when I was blowing things, or when I was showing it at the original. All right. Okay, but all this right. is, um, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of, it's a very, very frenetic icon, to say the least. Okay, but you can see the rope at the top there. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Right? All right. So, that's Judas killing himself. Okay. All right, so let's see what else we got there. 
Um, this is an interesting thing. We, we don't see this very often, but it does come from time to time. More in art beyond what we have in our iconography, but look here with the sun and the moon. Yeah, I was gonna ask. So okay. this, oh, that's a moon, okay. So the personification of the sun and the moon, they're also in the middle of everything, okay? Which is trying to indicate the, um, the fact that all of creation was kind of gasping in surprise and shock that you know here is the creator of everything being crucified on a cross i want to show you one more thing now down on the bottom in that black spot is that hades with yes. all those figures down yeah there let's stuff? let's take a look at a couple of things oh, okay. in, in detail okay these are all demons see them but they're oh, all they're like just, okay they're all kind of choking each other and freaked out and everything because you know again you know he's going into hades and destroying death by his death and they know that that's what's going to happen with him being down there and so they're frenzied they're extremely concerned and they should be because they're about to be destroyed look at this at the top Okay, it's hard to see because I'm zooming in so much, but let me see if I can go out a little bit. You're not going to see it very well. It's right? supposed to be a dove? It, no, it's a pelican. A pelican, in order to feed its young, will actually jab its beak into its own stomach. It's not a very pretty image, but it is one that is meant to say that in order for us to be saved, Christ has to basically kill himself, immolate himself so that we can live. And so he is, one of the images there is that he is a pelican, okay? He is willing to, to take on that particular aspect of a pelican so that we can live, okay? I mean, this is a very interesting icon. It's not traditional by any means, but it certainly depicts a lot of what's going on in um, our understanding of the passion of our Lord. Okay. I mean, all these people are different walks of life. You know, you've got the, um, you know, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, all them, you know, right? Whoops. See, I want to do that. Once I do that, I can't get rid of it. It's pretty annoying. Okay, right here, you see the Sadducee pointing to Jesus, basically saying, you know, he calls himself the king of the Jews. If he is the king of the Jews, let him come down from the cross and save himself. Right? That's what they say. Okay. All right. Anyone else have any questions or comments about it? That's a pretty crazy icon. I guess I'll just say that. Yeah. I mean, it's I just. Agree. Yeah, there's a lot it's going wild. on there. Yeah, there's a lot going on there. Um, obviously, it's not exactly how we would remember the crucifixion. A lot of times when we think of the crucifixion, we see it more like the other one that we have. Let me bring that back up. Um, what did I do with it? Yeah, come back. Hold on. There we go. No, not that one. The other one. This one. And even this one's busier than what we are familiar with. But here, I'll take. I'll bring it back to you. This one is more like what we're used to. But even this, having the two thieves there, is not what our icon is. Our icon is. Um, well, let me see if I can, I don't know if I have that. Let's see if I can find it. 
Probably not. Hmm, it's not looking good. No, I don't have I don't have it. But um it's basically John and the Theotokos and Jesus. Sometimes the centurion is there, sometimes not, but that's what we're more used to. We're more used to seeing it in a much more um stark kind of a manner, much more um you know just basic because what we remember in all of that is the encounter when Jesus is on the cross and he looks down and he sees those two and he says, you know, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother, right? Instead of all these other things, the hyssop and the spear and so on. But I mean, those are very helpful things. You know, the depictions are certainly not, you know, inaccurate, just another way of helping us understand what's going on. And the other one, you know, it's like super busy, but it still is accurate in terms of how it's trying to depict the things that are happening in it. Um, you know, there's one editorial message, and that is of the one thief who is being, you know, whose soul is being carried off to Hades. Um, that kind of reminds me of Mel Gibson's movie. I don't know if you ever saw it, but um, the bad thief there was horribly tormented by birds and the other one wasn't because he was good okay so any other questions or now comments? because so, go ahead. just real quick there because there's no red cloth there that's depicting that it's an outside correct okay yeah. yep can you comment on the two thieves why their arms are the way they are <laughs> Good Nancy, I was going to say that. Yeah, I noticed that. Well, let me see if the other one, let me pull that up. I don't think it shows them like that. I've never seen a picture, an icon with them like that. No? I think the yeah. other one had them with their arms weird too. Well, one sure was backwards did. even. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they're beat. Hold on. I'm having yeah. a hard time well, controlling this screen. Okay, so all right so look at the way that they're crucified okay and i've talked about this before um but it's okay i'm i i think it's important for us to remember crucifixion was not meant to be quick it was meant to be a long term like days long kind of torture all right so look at how jesus's feet are in this icon, you see that they're on a platform, okay? So the idea is that the feet are actually resting on a platform, the arms are outstretched, so everything is exposed for sure, but he's going to be there for a while, okay? He's not, I mean, he's uncomfortable, but he's not in a position where his being on the cross is going to kill him through wounding. It's going to kill him through through dehydration. It's going to kill him through exposure. It's going to kill him through suffocation. But it's not going to kill him through the wounds and through the torture of that. It's going to hurt like you would not believe. I mean, it's I don't I don't recommend that. But so looking at the other two, then this thief here, the good thief, he has his arms on the back because and, and his legs are being broken so they've removed his feet i guess at this point but the idea is at this point he's going to suffocate when you break the arm when you break the legs of the person they can no longer support their weight with their feet okay they have to um, rely on something else and in, in this case it's on the arms and the arms are going to put pressure on the lungs and on the diaphragm in both cases okay and what that ultimately does then 
is it causes um, the diaphragm to stop. And when the diaphragm stops, the lungs don't fill up with air and you suffocate. Isn't that fun? Yay. So um, a lot of times we tend to sanitize this stuff. I don't like sanitizing this stuff. I think it's important for us to understand what's going on here. Um, not so much with the two thieves. I'm not worried about the two thieves, but I am worried about you know exactly what it is with Jesus. And in his case, he had been beaten so much before everything that um, you know he he really didn't have. Um, much ability to withstand everything else that happened to him. You know, I think this is one area where um, the image of um, what um, Gibson did in his movie is probably pretty accurate. Because remember, before he's put up on the cross, he's whipped 39 times. Okay, and it's not just like a nice little whip, it's a whip that causes significant harm. It's scourging. Scourging is not the same thing as just being beaten with a lash. Okay, and I'm sorry for being so graphic, but he was really hurt bad before he was even crucified. Okay, so that's a large part of what happened with him. Now, looking at those two, then, basically, they're just in positions where they're just going to die quicker. Okay, because remember, the Sabbath is coming and they cannot have the, the thieves, because they're Jewish thieves, they can't have them up on the crosses over the Feast of the Pentecost. That's, that's obscene. So they had them, um, their executions hastened, hurried up so that they wouldn't remain on the cross over the Sabbath, which is Saturday. Okay. And, you know, one of the things this icon does a really nice job of, I think, is it, it demonstrates just how chaotic this situation is, okay? It's terribly chaotic because what you are watching or witnessing here is the fashioner of everything executed. How does it even work? You know, remember, in Christianity, God is crucified and killed. How does that happen? How can his own creation kill him? So it really helps to drive home the point of um, just how chaotic this situation really is. All right? Does it make sense? Yep. Pretty, pretty chaotic. I kind of like this icon. Other questions about it or anything else that we've talked about so far? So. I mean, Holy Week is really dealing with the emphasis of Christ's humility. We start off with the bridegroom, right? But the bridegroom is him dressed in a scarlet robe with a reed in his hand, and the crown of thorns on his head, his head bowed down in a form of humility, and he's and there's blood coming from his forehead because of the way they beat him over the head with that rod that he's holding in his hand. And then we go immediately from that, the bridegroom services to well, like I've said, unction doesn't really count, but the next major service is the service of the Last Supper, where the first thing he does, even before they commune together, is they um, have, his, um, have him wash their feet, right? Christ goes and washes the feet of the disciples. Again, another sense of, you know, true humility. And then we have the Last Supper, and then we have his crucifixion, okay? So... Um, and then I'm going to show you one last thing and then we'll close for the night, I think. Uh, let me see if I can find it real quick. Bear with me. Oops, nope, not that. Nope.
what we are looking at here is the epitaphian, okay? We have one of these in our church. It's very similar to this. I think we have angels in ours along with these figures. But we have, you know, this is his removal from the cross. So it's a transition from the cross to the tomb, which is behind, I'm going to guess that's Joseph of Arimathea back there. Okay, so there's Jesus obviously on the ground, his mother cradling his head, John kissing his hands, the myrrh bearing women singing their lamentations. We have Nicodemus and Joseph over here taking care of the body and bringing it to the tomb. Okay, so that is, um, and it's all in the form of a very large cloth that we actually take along with us when we do that Friday service of lamentations, right? We have the lamentations where we put this in the beer and we carry the beer around the church, right? So um, this is an icon, but it's a very significant icon in that we, you know, it has a special place. Who knows where this icon is in the church right now? It's above the doors. Yes. Is it above? It is. It's in a wooden box right above the yeah. doors as you leave. Okay. So that is where it stays until we have that service of Holy Friday. And then once we do that, then we take it, we put it right in the beer. Um, we actually take it, um, when we take Christ's body off the cross, we put this in the beer. And then once okay. we do that service of lamentations on Friday night, technically it's supposed to, from that point, go into the sanctuary and stay there until ascension. But what we do in our tradition is we leave the body in that beer for that evening, the lamentation service into um, the next morning of Holy Saturday, um, so that we can read Psalms or the gospel and um, have an overnight vigil right at the beer to imitate the myrrh bearing women holding vigil at Jesus's tomb. Okay. Um, but that cloth, that large cloth will remain on the altar from the time that we remove it from the beer, which again is the lamentation service. So we move from there until the Feast of Ascension. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, it stays on the altar where I serve the Divine Liturgy um, for all of those days. Okay, and it just remains there. And then once we get to Ascension, which is the ascent from, of Christ from earth to heaven, and we put it back in the box and we leave it there until um, the next lamentation service. Now, um, something I want to point out, when I sense the church, okay, we start inside the sanctuary, and I'll talk about this sensing in a greater detail later on, but when we sense the church, we start in the sanctuary, we then come out and we sense the echinostasis. At that point, or a certain point, I'm supposed to turn around and sense the epitaphian. A lot of people, I think, get confused and think that I'm sensing them. Um, I'm not. I sense you later. But I'm sensing instead the epitaphian that hangs above the door. That's exactly where it's supposed to be. In most churches, the epitaphian is exactly there. Um, and so that's why we have the epitaphian mounted above the doors. Because that's where it's supposed to be, on the um, westernmost wall of the church. But still inside the church, not in the narthex. Okay, so now we've covered the bridegroom, the foot washing, Last Supper, crucifixion, and removal um, from the cross, and more or less his entrance into the tomb. Okay, so does anyone have any questions at this point? No. Any comments or anything? No questions, thank you. Okay. I'm good, okay. thank you. Good. So we will cover the um, icon of Holy Saturday and of Holy Pascha next week. Um, and if you do think of any questions that you might have, um, please let me know. And um, don't be afraid to invite people if you think this has been helpful. Um, have them come and join us and we can talk about it together. Um, and like I said, as always, if you have any questions, um, please let me know so that I can help answer them. Okay. Will do. All right.
Thank you. Thank you, everybody. You have a great night. God bless you. And we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thanks.